sorry for that. Good evening. Uh, my name is Lisbeth Gumete. Welcome, welcome, welcome to the, to the dispensing lectures. Hope that they are very educational. On the agenda today, we will do welcomes and introductions. Like I said already, my name is Lisbeth Gumete. We have Dr. Liz Homawela joining us as well. He will participate later on when we are doing the question and answers. Sorry about that. We will talk a little bit about the course, the requirements for completing the course, how to approach your portfolio of evidence, uh, the weekly sessions and what they're meant for, how to give back your course experience and feedback, and how to contact us, which is easily done through Miss Lorraine Mashiho, whether through the WhatsApp group or via an email through to support at aquatraining.com, and she will direct your comment or feedback to the necessary person. So today we will be looking at learning activity number five, which is the patient information leaflet. You don't have to worry if you only raised that for the course today or last week, or you are just watching because you are interested and want to see if it's worth your time. It doesn't really matter. You will get the feel of what happens on the Wednesday sessions. But then today we will be helping you try and get through or navigate through activity number five. So your portfolio of evidence has eight activities. We do one of them weekly as they follow each other. It doesn't matter where you begin, as long as by the end of the, the, the course or before you submit, all eight activities are done. So the course is basically to assist um, all authorized prescribers become licensed dispensers. So if you wish to be a licensed dispenser, or you want to be able to dispense medicines within your facility. When you, when you are deemed competent through this course, you can then register for or requ request a license from the Department of Health. So again, the course is just there to help you get, to, uh, get your dispensing license it is a 30 credit or 300 national hour course after completion you will have a level six NQF qualification it has five specific outcomes the first one focusing more on the legal ethical and therapeutic cons considerations of dispensing the second one deals with uh, evaluation evaluating a prescription and being able to access a patient profile number three is being able to dispense the prescription number five is managing the number four sorry is managing the procurement and storage of medicine while five deals with patient advice to ensure the quality you use of medicines and improved healthcare, which the activity today also touches a bit on. So the activity today touches a bit on number three and a bit of number five. So for you to complete the course and be deemed competent, you must work through the resource guide or your study guide, whichever you prefer to call it, and then work through your portfolio of evidence and then submit that. Which, we, which is what we try to help you in every Wednesday. You submit that, including your affidavit on the day of the summative assessment. We advise that you always keep a copy of your POE. So when you've done all your eight activities, make, you, make a copy of it for safekeeping for later use, whether um, it is lost somewhere or you something that you can refer back to later on in your practice. So today the information that you're gonna need is within your resource guide on page 33 and 185 and 186. For you to be deemed competent, you must submit a fully completed POE. So on the Wednesday sessions, we do them one by one, but you're more than welcome to do them at your own pace at your own time and only get assistance here when you need it. And then you'll be required to write a summative um, assessment, which will be a multiple choice. And then there's also a practical component, which you will choose how you want to do the demonstration, whether it's virtually or you want an actual contact session. So the course is, is in, um, ideally completed within six months. Here is a rough back 
uh, breakdown of what you can do when to try and make sure that you are done within the six months. So the coursework ideally should not take you more than three months. That is now written through the resource guide and also writing out your POE, and then you do the summative, ass uh, summative assessment, which is should be done within a week. Then there is the post of evidence review, which takes on about four to six weeks. And then you could also resubmit if there's a need for that, which will take on about two weeks. And then there's the preparation for the practical exam, which you can choose to make it either virtually or in person, which will take about six weeks. So remember when you are done with your portfolio of, of evidence to submit it at support at aquatraining.com. Ms. Lorraine Mashiho will access it and submit it to relevant persons and give you feedback on that. If for some reason, like maybe the POE is not completed the right way or there's information missing and you are deemed not yet competent by the assessor, you will need to pay a resubmission fee of 300 Rand and then uh, resubmit your documents and you will be given feedback within four to six weeks. But if you are deemed um, competent, you should be able to receive your certificate within a month of being deemed competent. If you have any course experience or feedback that you'd like to share with us, whether that be myself or Dr. Lisa Homawela, please forward it through to support at aquatraining.com. So today we will be looking at patient information leaflet. The outcomes for the activity is you must be able to distinguish between a package insert and a patient information list leaflet. You must be able to demonstrate an understanding of how to draw up a patient leaflet using the correct headings, the terms rele rele relevant to the patients and the legislative requirements. You must be also able to distinguish between information regarding the medicine which is relevant and important to the patient versus information that is intended for the healthcare professional. So you must be able to know which information you need as the prescriber and slash dispenser and what information is necessary for you to give to the patient during your dispensing process. So if you look at a package insert, a package insert is what that little paper that you find inside each medication that you receive from the supplier or the manufacturer. So it is the responsibility of the manufacturer to ensure that each medicine leaving their facility going to dispatch or to the suppliers or the distributors has a package insert. The package insets are also approved and they have a registration date and they have a release date. So you don't just wake up in the morning and decide whatever you can write about that. So each medicine has an approved package insert that goes with it. Same with the patient information leaflet. It must be written prior and it must be approved. It's approved more or less the same time as when the medicine is approved. So there's a certain way or certain structure that it must follow for it to be approved by SAPRA. So before it can be approved, it must go through verifications and it must, it must be deemed correct as well before it's approved. So now it must have the scheduling status. It must state there that this medication is scheduled one, schedule zero, schedule four. It must have the proprietary name and the dosage form. Uh, it must have the medicine composition. With the medicine composition, it must list everything. That is the active ingredient and all excipients inside. It because they might be allergic, you might be allergic to one of the excipients and not the active ingredient. So with the composition, it must list everything that is in there the pharmacological classification and the pharmacological action, the indications, contraindications warnings and all special precautions, interactions, um, whether it's safe to use during pregnancy and lactation, the dosage and direction for use, also the side effects. When uh, there are known symptoms of overdose, they are listed there and how to treat them. There's the identification, how to actually identify this pill. If you find this pill, if you look at the package insert, it should be able to tell you if this is the correct pill or not, how it's presented, whether it's in a container or it's in a blister package, 
storage instructions, which storage does the, the, the manufacturer recommend to make sure that this space is safe until its expiry date? The registration number, the registration number of the medicine itself. When was this medicine registered safe for use within that particular country? The name and business address of the yeah. holder of the certificate of registration. Plus, yeah. <laughs> um, could we try and maybe mute our mics? And then lastly, it will have the date of, pu of publication of the package inset. So whenever the package inset is now approved, that date will be there on the package inset itself. Now, there comes the patient information leaflet. This one is directed at the patient themselves. This is what they are encouraged to read, to get information on. Um, according to legislature, no medicine is supposed to leave your facility without this piece of paper. Even if you are ordering bulk medication, you will see that it will come with a little stash of those leaflets for you to dispense, to, to issue out with every dispensing. So according to the law, you must make sure that each and every medicine leaving your facility has this, because when you are not there, the, the patient must refer back to something to give them the information that they require. Last, we spoke about um, the labels. So the labels and the, 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 the patient information leaflet must be handed out to the patient as a communication tool when now the patient is no longer within your vicinity. Now, you must make sure that when you are giving out information to the patient or when you are, when you are during your dispensing, during your counseling, make sure that what you are telling the patient is, is exactly as per the leaflet. Because when they go home and then they read through and then it's not the same, they're going to come back to you and it might not be a nice encounter. If for whatever reason, you are also some of the information it's best to tell them. If you are using the medication for what it's not indicated for, for example, you need to be open about that to the patient before they go and read the patient leaflet and then come back to you saying that um, what you gave them is incorrect. And then trying to explain the second time around might be more difficult than actually explaining the first time around. So just remember that it is actually a legal requirement. It is according to legislation that each and every medicine leaving your facility must contain the patient information leaflet. So also, if you look at the two, you will find that the formatting of it or the structuring of the two documents is more or less the same. The only difference most of the time is just the language. And then there are dosage forms that make the difference seem a bit more evident. So if you are comparing a package uh, insert and a patient information leaflet of uh, like a tablet, any tablet, for example, it would look more or less the same, even with the syrup, it would look more or less the same. But then with your inhalers, your sprays, your vaginal creams, or you know, anything that has a specific way of use might look a bit different because then they might have illustrations to help the patient use the medication safely. Remember with a patient information leaflet, they are intended to help the patient. So the other one is more for the prescriber, hence the different type of language. If you compare the two, you will realize that with a package insert, the language is more pharmaceutical, pharmacological, or more of the, of the health profession because they assume that you went to whatever school and you understand that kind of limbo. But then now when it comes to the patient information leaflet, they understand that anybody with like a grade 10 um, uh, what level of education should be able to understand it. So they use a more lay kind of language 
that's where the illustrations come in. So you will see that with an inhaler, for example, there will be instructions on what to do, how to remove the cap. If it's something that needs reassembling, there will be instructions on how to reassemble that, but only within the leaflet and not within the PI. So with the PIL, there will be those little instructions, even if it's a, it's a suppository, it will have those little pictures of where to insert what, so that there's at least a, a way to ensure safety and also to encourage adherence because if you don't know how to use something you might not be able to you might not comply as far as using it is concerned but then the structure of it remains the same the only thing that might differ is the the, the language use so when you when you when you pick up a, a piece of paper even before knowing that it's a PI or PIL, the language itself should be somewhere, especially within the dosaging and the instructions and the warnings, there the language becomes a bit more relaxed to be able to allow the, the community to understand. But then the structure still contains the scheduling status, the proprietary name and the dosage form, the medicine composition, uh, the approved indications and uses. You, you will see that on the other side, it just says indications, but here they emphasize approved indications and uses so that the patient knows that actually this medication is intended for this, even if they use for something else, but then the, the, the patient information leaflet must be able to inform them of what the medication was intended to use for. It will then have instructions before taking the medications. So now your warnings your, your, and your special precautions, your contraindications, your warnings and your interactions become grouped. And it, they become in a way that it tells the patient, that, okay, before you take this medication, here's what you, look, you need to look out for. Whereas with the PI, because it's talking to you directly, it will just say a warning contraindications, interactions, but then here they are grouped in a way to allow the patient to know that, okay, before I drink this, maybe I should consider one, two, three, four, five. And then it always comes with um, a little, uh, what, what should we call them warnings to say, before you take this, always consult your healthcare professional. If you're pregnant or you're breastfeeding, please consult your doctor or pharmacist. So it always has within the PIL itself, it will always have this um, open quote, end quote warnings to say, please, before you take this medication, make sure that you've spoken to your healthcare professional. It will have instructions on how to take the medication. Instead of the other side, where it will just be dosage and then it will list them according to the ages. Here, the language will be more on instructions on how to use the medicines. And then it will have, again, little warnings like, do not share uh, medicine prescribed for you with any other person. And then on the dosaging as well, we have little notes like consult your doctor or pharmacist. If neither is available, go to your nearest hospital or poison control centers. So you will always have those little warning signs. Some other leaflets will go as far as highlighting them in different colors. So like with medication that has higher toxicity of certain, med of certain levels, it will make sure that those little warnings within the PIL themselves are read so that they can be able to catch the patient's attention more than the other information that may not be necessarily important for the patient. Because like with the registration, that's not really important. But then the side effects might, might be important. The interaction, the, sorry, some of the dosage uh, so toxicities might be important. Some of whether you're breastfeeding or you're pregnant, that might be important. So with cytotoxic medication, for example, it will have that part on, of the PIL red or in a bolder color to be able to attract the patient's um, attention before even taking the medications. And then it will list some of the side effects and, and ask you to look out for them. Because with patients, the other thing that they try to avoid is listing the, the, the side effects in a way that may make them feel that some of the people when once they read them then suddenly they have them so then the language is you might so that the people know what they could expect but then they don't immediately assume that they have it and then it will have a storage and disposal instructions and again those little quoted information like keep out of reach of children and then the medicine pre presentation including the number the volume 
the MS package unit and the packaging material. Again, how to be able to identify the medication, its registration number, the telephone number, the name of the business that registered the medication, and the date of publication of the actual um, leaflet. With complementary medicines, they will in on both the PI and the PIL, it will state that, that this medicine is not uh, approved by the Medicines Control Council or SAPRA or anything like that, because they must state there that this medication is not necessarily, it is regulated, but it is not necessarily registered. So with all your, your complementary medicines towards the end, of the leaflet, or sometimes even at the beginning, they will state there that this medicine is not has not been tested by the medicine control castle. Therefore, this medicine is not intended for diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease. Because remember, when it's registered, it went through all the testing, and now the company or the manufacturer can guarantee all those dosages. But with this one, they must state that it has nothing to do with the medicines control council, and you are essentially taking it at your own risk. Now, the main um, difference between the two, like I said, the PI is information designed mainly for the healthcare professional. So this is where, even if, like we always say, you must have all your resource documents within your facility. So as much as you are supposed to make sure that you have all your um all your memes, your pharmacological books, your, your, all of that. But then if you have, if you are just given a prescription and you're not sure of what is what, you can just take out the PI and read through, or you, are, you want to prescribe it for someone, but you're not really sure because there's always new medication every now and again. So you can just read the PI, it will tell you what it's for. So the PI is more for the prescriber to know if they're prescribing the right medication for the right patient. Whereas the PIL is information tool designed for the patient so that they learn more about the medicine and the correct use of this medicine. So the information on the other side is based mostly on the prescriber to ensure that they're prescribing the right medicine for the right patient for the right use. Whereas the other one is there to encourage correct use of the medicine in hopes to increase patient um, adherence. The other one uses more medical or pharmacological language. The other one is made to, the, the assumption is that if you, you've reached grade, grade eight or grade 10, somewhere there, you should be able to um, understand the language. So the other one is supposed to give you information, the PI is supposed to give the healthcare professional information in order to improve patient counseling, while the other one is supposed to give the patient information in order to improve adherence. Uh, in most cases, the PI does not contain illustrations, whereas the PIL will contain in, in illustrations, but this is more for your um, creams and your, uh, what is it, creams, your pessaries, your suppositories, your inhalers, and your sprays, because they are used differently. But then with your oral preparations, most of the time, um, there is no clear difference when it comes to their structure. So the way that they flow is more or less the same, except for the difference in language and those extra uh, warning signs every now and again, and those extra encouragements for you to go and speak to your healthcare professional if you don't understand any of the instructions. Now, coming back to the actual activity, um, um, basically you are given a, a API and a PIL of betlemethasone inhaler. And you are asked to then answer the following question. Uh, the question is in your, own, in your own opinion, which of the two documents being the PI or the PIL would you promote patient would promote patient adherence and then you give five reasons to support your your, your answer you are encouraged to use any other nasal spray pi um, but if you want to further understand the difference between the two i suggest you take out a pi and a pil of a normal um, any oral tablet that you can find and then you compare that with any pi and pil of any inhaler, any nasal spray, 
any vaginal cream, any suppository, then you'll be able to clearly see the difference between the two. And then after having studied those two, you then come back and say, okay, I think that this one is better suited for the patient. It will promote patient adherence better because it allows for one, two, three, four, five. So all you have to do with this one, it's, it's, it's pretty, pretty short. It's shorter than most of the other activities you've had to do. Basically, you go look at the PI for the petlamethasone that is already or within your POE. Study both um, informations. There's the PI there. Lisa, you read through the whole thing. You look at the PI, you look through the whole thing. After having done that, you then decide, for my patient, I feel that this document would better promote patient adherence. And these are my five reasons. And then that's it. If you can just remember anything from this slide, you will be able to know that, okay, fine. Uh, I promoted this because I feel that this patient would be would benefit from more of a pharmaceutical language or whichever one you want to go with. So um, that's basically what you need to do. I hope it wasn't too quick, but I, I do believe that we probably have an understanding. So yeah, let's now unmute our mics and discuss any question that anybody has. If um, you don't understand any of the content given, if you would like us to actually take out the PI, the, the PI or the PIL and actually go through it right now, we can also do that. Only if anybody wants us to do that with a request, of course. Um, but yeah, so that's basically what you need to do. Look at those two documents within your portfolio of evidence and then decide which one do you think is more suitable for the patient and then you give out your five reasons. If you read through your resource guide as to what a PI is and what a PIL is, you should be able to make the decision very quickly. And also remember, according to the law, the PIL must be part of the dispensing process. It must be issued to the patient. They must leave with that so that they can be able to refer to it. It forms part of patient counseling to improve adherence. All right, any questions? Any feedback? You can type it out if you don't want to um, say anything. Or just an indication that everybody's okay, everybody understands anything. Yes, you know, anything? I will maybe no, type it. For me at the, oh, no, 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 there's nothing for me at the moment. I actually pressed my speaker by mistake. Oh, okay. I was happy. I thought we were now participating. I actually came in a bit late. I'm so sorry. Oh, no, I'll, no, no, I'll no. be more participative next time. Pleasure, pleasure. Please do. Thank you. Yes, Rose. Okay. Uh, my question is not with... Uh today's learning activity. All right. It's on a learning activity for drug calculations. Uh -huh. So uh, I think I have a problem. I'm listening. Uh, because, um, yes, uh, I don't know if I have to, to calculate the number of tablets when I'm using five milligrams and the number of tablets when I'm using 25, or a, my answer had to try to get the number of tablets 
when I'm combining both to reduce the pill burden? When you're combining both to reduce the pill burden. Oh, okay. Yes. So with yeah. the higher strength, you're using more of the 25 milligram. And then with the lower strength, you're going to use more of the five to avoid confusion. So then it's, it's you, you are reducing the pill burden, but then you must list how many of these and how many of that oh. are you going to issue. Okay, I get it yeah. now. Okay, then. perfect. Any other question? Anybody? Oh, are we good? Am I that good of a and as of a of a facilitator that everybody understands? Should I pet myself in the back and be like, "Yay"? Uh, hi, Liz. How are you? Putting yourself, V. I'm good. Um, I've got a general question here. Mm -hmm. I would like to understand the difference between the PR number and the MP number? Okay. Um, the practice number, right? Dr. Mawela, please do come in. Isn't the MP number that what you, ha you have yourself registered with with, uh, with, what you, with the medicine council? Dr. Mawela, I don't want to lie. But yeah, the practice number is what you are you register your practice with. Because I know that where, with, with medical aids, for example, when you are claiming, you claim according to your practice number. So your practice number is what the practice is registered for. But then your MP number, that's your registration as the provider. So there's the registration as the provider, and then there's the practice number of the facility. That's my understanding. I was hoping Dr. Mawela will be able to see, to say if I'm correct with that, but that's my understanding. The practice number is the number of the facility in the practice that you registered on. But then with the MP number, that's your registration with, within your council or within your statutory body. So like with us, I have my own P number as a pharmacist by myself, but then where I work, they have their own practice number. So the practice number is the facility within which you work. And then like with the ROPS, the entire of ROPS has one practice number, but then within ROPS, each and every person that is registered has their own MP number or their P number. So that's my understanding with an MP and the practice and the PR number. Okay, so so um, MP, okay, yeah. for example, if I register a clinic, mm -hmm. so that clinic will have a PR number yes. and my sunk number or whatever that I'll get, it's yes. going to be an MP number. Yes. Okay. Thank you so much. Only a pleasure. Thank you. And the PR number is the number that you are going to use with all your your claims. Your claims, whenever you're registering with Medisco for claims, they pay per practice number and not per MP number. Yes, Rose? Yeah, okay, uh, yeah, I think she understood. I wanted to just to add something. Uh, mm -hmm. the, 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 the practice number you get when you register with the Board of Health Funders. And then the MP number in our case is the is the sunk number. If you are a if if you are a if you are a nurse, is the sunk number. Thank you for that, Rose. Thank you, Rose. Welcome. Anything else? Anybody? Can I ask how far is is everybody? Like um, those that are registered for the course already, um, how far are you guys, and how are you finding the course so far? Just general question. Just want to get it, the the feel of it. Those that are registered, how how far are you guys, and how are you finding the activities? Okay, let's we here. Uh, I've started um, 
a week ago okay. and I did about um two activities because um uh, after I just had a, 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 a vaccination and I got like very, very sick. It's only now that I'm recovering to come back to my books again. Oh, sorry for that. Uh, all right. But remember, you don't have to push yourself too hard. You have six months to to do everything v so you don't have to feel bad if you are sick you can actually take some time off and rest plus we are here to help you in any way we can but i hope the two that you've done are are not bad i'm sure you can also uh, uh, request some of the um, some of the previous recordings if you need to and also you can ask any question from whichever whatsapp group you're in i'm sure you should be able to get assistance but don't stress if you are sick for like a week and can't keep up. It's really not a train smash. There's ample time for you to catch up, but I'm glad that you are trying your level best to push as far as you can. That's very nice. Anything else? Bab Sydney, you okay? Sis Busis, are you okay? Nicolette, to right? Sis D, you okay? Good evening. Good, good evening, my dear. Hi, dear. Yes, yes. I think today it's my first day. So, yeah, I wouldn't say much, but I think I would. I once tried to do this course, so I think I'll move a little bit faster. That's from next week. But yeah, it's my first day today. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Um, hello. Hi, Nicolette. Yes, uh, uh, only got registered yesterday, so I haven't really started. But yeah, I think I'll I'll see along the way once I've started with the activities. Okay. Congratulations on registering. Hope we finish on time. No pressure. Nothing. All right. Um, I'm going to assume that everybody's fine um, and we are going to end the session. We will chat again next week, um, Wednesday. Next week, Wednesday, we are doing um, number, 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 number six. Right, yes, next week we're doing number six, which is, which is, let me, let, me, let me try to get that right now. We're doing drug interactions. So next week we're doing case studies on drug interactions. So everybody can maybe have a look through that um, if you can beforehand. And then also remember whatever questions, whatever problems you encounter along the way, please do keep a note of them or something and then we discuss them as we go. But then next week we're doing drug interactions. So um, what you can do, you're number five today, right? And then if you encounter any problems with, with, the, with the activity, we discuss that also again tomorrow, land, sorry, next week. And then also please do have a look if you get a chance, even if it's just an hour before we actually do it, just have a look at drug interactions so that you, you make the hour more useful. Then you know you are looking at something that you've seen. So next week we are doing drug interactions. So yeah, let's do this again next week. Enjoy your evening. All right, thank you very much, everyone. Um, this is Dr. Mawela, just wishing you well. Um, until we meet again next week. Just remember, if you are new, don't put yourself under pressure. Uh, we are now going to learning activity number six. When we get to eight, we will restart again from one, two, three, four, five. So yeah, continue working on your e-learning um, um, support, but also attend the Wednesday uh, meeting so that you can ask questions and you can make sure that you get your POE um, um right you know the first time and avoid a lot of um, readmissions all right thank you very much enjoy your evening liz you are the best thank you very much 
Um, bye -bye. For this. God bless you. Bye, guys. God bless you. Night.